This video is brought to you by Audible. Stick around to the end to hear more. Eh, get it? Cause you just play the damn video. When we use the term Christianity, it's tempting to think of one cohesive religious body working together to bring the world into a holy brotherhood of man. But the reality is sometimes more like a Voltron of different denominations begrudgingly joined together, vaguely attempting to kick at its own shins and punch itself in the face. You've got the Eastern Orthodox Church holding over from the Byzantine Empire, the Catholic Church continuing the tradition of St. Peter, but somewhere between the Crusades and now, we also got Lutherans, Calvinists, Anglicans, Episcopalians who are like Anglicans but not English, and ugh, guys, you're killing me here. So, to figure out how we got from point A through point C through P-4.5, I'll spin you a yarn of the 15 and 1600s, the centuries of the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation. So get ready to do some history on tonight's Pope Fight! Our first event pits the Vatican against literally itself as corruption dominated the church at the turn of the 16th century. The Borgia Pope, Alexander VI, had sullied the papacy with what I can only describe as an orgy of orgies. And it didn't help that he also sent his manic son Cesare to try and conquer Italy for the Papal States, the Pope's territorial holdings around Rome. In 1506, Pope Julius II began work on the new Basilica of St. Peter as well as the fresco ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, both funded largely by the sale of indulgences. These bad boys were the get out of purgatory free cards church officials sold for upwards of half a year's wages, essentially buying your way into heaven. His successor, Leo X, wasn't exactly a beacon of integrity either, so the church of the early 1500s is really not looking its best. If I had to chalk it up, I'd say Catholic Church, zero lessons learned from the last pope fights, eh, also zero. Now, even before this, centuries of faithful Christians had been voicing their concerns about the way the church works, including our boy Dante, addressing persistent issues of divine accessibility and institutional corruption. Fast forward to 1517, and a German monk named Martin Luther posted a Twitter rant the old-fashioned way by nailing it to the door of the local church. Little did he know that things would escalate inconceivably quickly from this point on. What started with, hey, I'm pretty sure that the sale of indulgences is total bullcrap, became only our faith can save us, which then became came, and the church can't save you, and then that became, oh, by the way, the Pope isn't infallible, and in fact, they and the entire clergy make mistakes all the time, and finally became, you know what, no. The priesthood is meaningless, nobody is any more holy than anybody else. It's like every time Martin Luther sits down, he gets another idea, takes a shot, runs back up to the microphone, and shouts, and another thing. And honestly, in 1517, you can't really blame him. What started with the 95 Theses as a call to stop the sale of indulgences very quickly transformed into him calling for a complete reconstruction of the church and its priorities. So for our next fight, we pit 1,500 years of tradition and the most powerful bureaucracy in European history against one hat boy. When Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor of Germany and Spain, called for Martin Luther to make his case in the hopes of humiliating him, he doubled down on all of his reformist claims. A bold move. After that, the madman tripled down, hiding away in a castle to work on a fully German translation of the Bible, which he then distributed for cheap through the newfangled printing press. This allowed thousands of ordinary people to bypass the gatekeeping of priests and get in with the OG. Now, as far as opening up religion to the German masses goes, this was a runaway success. Except it didn't quite have the desired effect overall. Far from getting the church in Rome to change its ways, they seemed to be stubbornly staying their course, and the Bible's new readers developed wildly different headcanons about the road to divine salvation. Rather than demanding reform in a unified voice, these splintered out into dozens of directions, each accusing the others of being obviously entirely wrong and super going to hell. Guess times don't really change all that much. But also, this really shouldn't have been a surprise. It's because of the radical democratization of knowledge that everyone was free to make their own interpretation. So the consistent theme of spirituality is up to you was essentially destined to diverge on the details. For instance, Germany saw a 300,000 strong peasant revolt in 1525, arguing along Luther's ideas, but instead they demanded political freedom from serfdom, storming several churches in the process. Luther thought that this was distinctly uncool as his beef was spiritual, not political. But we're dealing with Renaissance Europe here, so separating those two is like telling an alcoholic priest to stop hogging the blood of Christ. 
They're not coming apart. In other smashy business, young Protestants in Germany and Switzerland took to heart what the Bible said about avoiding graven images, so they dashed the R work and whitewashed local churches to avoid any distractions between people and God. In the following centuries, Protestant art became increasingly secular, with landscapes, portraits, still life, and historical paintings taking over from the highly religious art of the Renaissance that they saw as borderline blasphemous to depict. A major exception is the work of Dutch painters like Rembrandt, who covered religious topics but through a strictly historical lens. Instead of paintings, for the most part, Protestants were waging their ideological campaigns through books. <laughs> Like a bunch of nerds! While Pope Leo wrote off this Martin Luther guy as a local problem, it would swiftly become clear that the Reformation was much bigger than one hammer-happy German priest. It's one thing when some random monk says, screw the church, I'll do it myself, but what about when a king says it? In 1525, Albert founded the Duchy of Prussia as the first explicitly Protestant state, which came with the added benefit of you get to take the church's stuff and land and also not pay any taxes to Rome. It's a pretty good deal, all things considered. In England, Henry VIII was the second king to break with Catholicism, founding the Anglican Church so that he could divorce his wife. Sss. Lots of them. While would-be kings were seeing dollar signs everywhere from the land, money, and power, and heirs they could yoink by ditching Catholicism, we've also got to consider the millions of people across Europe who deeply believe that they, for pretty much the first time in history, were able to literally take their faith into their own hands by reading the Bible. That's huge! Dude. You're getting too analytical. What? We need more memes. Righto. Score at the end of round two is Catholics, one corrupt church, Protestants. Oof. Yikes. And that's the simplified graph. Anyway, it's been a hot minute. How about we sack Rome again? Yeah. For round three today, we have the Papal States pleasantly minding their own business and coming down the peninsula to ruin their century are the Germans. Again. No. Again. Well, yes, but that one comes later. Geez, Germany, tell us how you really feel. Anyway, after winning a battle with France, the armies of Charles V went rogue and marched into Rome to sack the city. Now, the fun part of this is that Italy, France, and Germany were all ruled by Catholics, so this conflict makes zero sense because nonsense is the M.O. of European history. In short, Rome remained a powerless ghost town for a century after the sack, only getting back on its feet for a full Baroque revival in the later 16 and 1700s. That makes the score... One really big oof. But just because Rome got trashed doesn't mean that Catholicism was twiddling its thumbs for two centuries. The church overall realized that it needed a makeover, and at the Council of Trent from 1545 to 1563, they did three important things. They affirmed Catholic doctrine on the sources of divine authority and salvation, they reformed church practices to better educate the priests with seminaries and the Jesuit order, and they asserted the focus of Catholicism on personal spirituality. Now, putting aside differences in whether or not the bread and wine is really the body and blood of Christ, this this looks strikingly familiar to the goals of Protestantism. Educate the faithful to deepen their connection with God. The means for this counter-reformation, however, were quintessentially Catholic. Since a lot of people couldn't read that well, the church doubled down on art. It was essentially religious propaganda, yes, but damn if it isn't some of the best art around. Painting, sculpture, even architecture are dynamic, intense, and vivid. Another massive jump in quality and photorealism after the Renaissance. The most striking aspect to me is the way that weight and movement capture deep emotions. The painter Caravaggio and Bernini the sculptor are masters at this. I mean, I like Baroque, okay? I know what I'm about. But big picture, it's neat how asymmetrical the conflict was. Protestant literary culture was revolutionary, and Catholics pulled out all the stops for art. Bringing a knife to a gunfight is a done deal, but bringing a book to a painting fight is a much more intriguing matchup. At the end of this round, it's books, good, art, good. More culture is good. Everybody wins. Anyway, now let's talk about people losing really, really badly and also dying. Fun. Part of the problem with talking about the Reformation and Counter-Reformation is that I could be here literally all day dishing on 200 years of the history of all of Europe. That stuff is dense. So, uh, speed round. Here's a quick list of some of the wars happening. Wow, that sure is a lot of stabbing. I'm skipping all of it. What matters for our purposes is that in addition to territorial ambitions, nations now had ideological religious grounds for allying with or hating each other. Cool, moving on. In 1555, the Peace of Augsburg granted individual states in the Holy Roman Empire the right to choose Catholicism or Protestantism. Granted, it was princes who made that choice rather than the subjects, but it's still better than nothing. However, things were not all fun and tolerance. France in 1572 was still Catholic, but a minority of Protestant Huguenots 
Huguenots had grown to about one in six Frenchmen. Catholics tried to assassinate a prominent Huguenot in Paris, but whiffed it, so the monarchy finished the job. But then, on St. Bartholomew's Day, the Catholic mobs thought that they had royal consent to go nuts, so they slaughtered thousands of Huguenots. Real Christ-like guys. Have fun in Circle 7. Next up is a war that started over religion and ended because nobody likes the Habsburgs. They're spread all across Europe and they made drawing this map exceptionally annoying. I would tell the Habsburgs to go screw themselves, but they beat me to the punch. In 1618, their dominions in Spain, Naples, and Austria got into a tiff with the Protestant parts of Germany as well as the Netherlands and Scandinavia, and this became the Thirty Years' War. It started, settled down when the Catholic Habsburgs won a battle, and started back up again when Protestant Sweden jumped in for rounds two, and Catholic France did a heckin' bamboo by joining in against the Habsburgs, fearing their impending hegemony over Europe if they won, Catholic allegiances notwithstanding. The war ended with the Treaty of Westphalia, which allowed minority communities of Protestants and Catholics across Europe to practice their own worship at home without the threat of interference. This is where you can see people realizing, hey, look, guys, we can all keep killing each other, or we can calm down and deal with this like adults. And it's no surprise that this culture of tolerance would very quickly produce the Enlightenment. And our final score for tonight's Pope fight is Wars. Too many. I don't like it. Cool art. A lot, actually. That one turned out pretty good. And finally, object lessons and how you can't stab your way out of a disagreement and cultural triumphs like the Enlightenment are only possible when you recognize that the person on the other side of an argument is also a human being with thoughts and feelings? One. But that's a very important one. In conclusion, Martin Luther saw a church that needed reform badly. Beyond indulgences, people from all over church history saw deep issues with the way things operated and wanted to change it. It should be no surprise that Luther's theological whirlwind had an impact far outside of the Protestant world he inadvertently created. In the end, yeah, there may be a few too many denominations to keep track of, but Luther's primary goals were fulfilled. The Catholic Church reformed, and now nearly everybody who wants it, regardless of denomination, has direct access to the Bible. Self-reflection can be a difficult process, but confront our failures makes us all better off. Dude, the memes. Right. Um, ta-da! Martin Luther recognized the power of books, so he would be thrilled to know that nowadays you can listen to them from literally anywhere with today's sponsor, Audible. With an astoundingly huge catalog of audiobooks to choose from, Audible is the world's leader in cutting out the middleman between an author's ideas and your brain. It's no secret that Red and I do a lot of research on this channel, so it's great to hit up an audiobook while walking to and from the library, or just having it in the background while making food or playing video games. And of course, I've got to mention my absolute favorite feature, speed control. I know some of you listen to me on 1.25 speed, I admit, I talk a little slow sometimes, but hey, Audible lets you give your tracks a little zoom zoom if you're one of those gotta go fast types. Audible members who sign up get a credit for any audiobook, completely free, every month, as well as additional discounts in the store. If you want to dig deeper into the Reformation, consider checking out this extremely comprehensive audiobook for free, because Audible is offering all of you a 30-day trial and one free audiobook, along with two free Audible originals to get you started if you sign up with our link on audible.com slash overly sarcastic, or text overly sarcastic to 500-500. If you do, you'll be supporting the channel and getting a good audiobook in the process. Again, go to audible.com dot com slash overly sarcastic and the ghost of Martin Luther will be very proud of you.